All right, everyone. It's the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast, your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. I'm Robert Winfrey. I am your host. I would like to thank you also very much for joining me this evening, or afternoon, or morning, whenever you happen to be listening to this. I appreciate it. On the agenda today, we have UFC 265. That went down last night, and I said it was a good card on paper, and by and large, it delivered. So we'll be going over all the results of that. Not a tremendous amount of news. Uh, I couldn't find a whole lot of it, actually, from the last week that wasn't stuff, you know, promotional material or hype pieces around 265. So we should be out of here fairly quickly. There are a few bits of news, of course, but nothing nothing too earth-shattering or anything like that to discuss. Uh, before we get into the show, I'd like to thank you all very much for uh, interacting with this product however you can. A like, a comment, uh, follow or subscribe, depending on your platform of choice. If you can interact with the individual episodes, please do so. If you're doing this on one of the platforms that requires you to give a larger, <laughs> instead of rating individual episodes, a rating for the whole thing, your Apple Podcast does this most famously. Uh, feel free to give the show a review of whatever you think is appropriate. More than one star, but if you don't think it's a five-star show, I, I understand. But I know I'm better than a one-star show, so please, that's all I ask. Be fair, but uh, somewhere in the two to five range. Because I've heard the one-star shows, and this is better than that. Uh, that is all of that, I believe, as far as the preamble goes. So, with that out of the way... Let's go ahead and jump into the action. Last night, UFC 265. Whew, boy, your main event. I set, I don't want to rehash this too much, but I will discuss it a little bit. I thought the inclu- uh, this didn't need to be a title fight. It's somewhat ridiculous that there was an interim heavyweight title fight at all. Given that yeah, and, and the UFC promotional material for this really kind of annoyed me a little bit. One of the uh, one of the opening sound bites that was used in the hype piece for this fight, uh, I think in the cold open for the pay-per-view, was a sound bite from Dana White at a press conference saying, you know, Francis is off traveling the world on vacation and whatnot, and you know, call us when you're ready to fight. And I. <sighs> It's a ridiculous name. I said this at the time. The UFC put a tremendous amount of effort into making Francis Ngannou a fairly big deal. And now that he's the champion, they're just kind of dumping on the guy. <laughs> Almost every opportunity. Uh, Ngannou, his people were, they were very upfront with the UFC, apparently, in the wake of him winning the belt, that he wanted to fight in September. That's not an unreasonable timeline, if you look at when he won the belt. Uh, as of yesterday, when the fight took place, the UFC heavyweight... It had been 132 or 33 days since the UFC heavyweight title had been contested. That's entirely reasonable, especially when you consider some of the others. I mean, for crying out... Let's see if I can find the tweet. Uh, somebody did the math on this, and I, I want to make sure I am correct. So... Forgive me just a second. Now, the heavyweight title is not... Uh, it's not... Yeah, here it is. No. Uh, other titles have been defended and fought and can have been contested since Nganu won the belt. But if we look at other titles in the UFC... So yeah, as of, so as of yesterday, it was 133 days since the UFC heavyweight title was defended. The women's featherweight title, which is... N women's featherweight is not a division, but it hadn't been defended in 154 days. Ditto bantamweight and light heavyweight. Uh, all of those were, of course, contested on the same card. Uh, that was... What card was that? Oh, that would have been the... If the light heavyweight belt was on the line, that would have been the... Uh, Blahovich and Adesanya card. Find that specifically because I hate flailing about in the dark. At 259, UFC 259 is that particular card in question. When we had, yeah, we had Sterling win the belt via DQ. Amanda Nunes 
ran over Megan Anderson, and Blahovich and Adesanya put in a fairly decent fight, actually. So all three of those belts haven't been defended since that particular event, which March 6th of 2021. Then it gets longer. The featherweight title has not been defended for 391 days. And there has not been a single solitary peep about throwing an interim belt at 145. Now, I understand some of why that hasn't that particular belt hasn't been defended. Part of it was COVID restrictions that took place over that since that period of time. Uh, then they scheduled it and Volkanovski actually got COVID. And the UFC's response to that particular delay was not, sure, let's rebook it in a reasonable time frame. It was, hey, why don't you and Ortega coach tough? Thus delaying the entire proceeding by an extra three months for a pointless reality show that I, I don't know anyone that's watching that show. That's not true. I know one guy who's watching the fights, and apparently there's only been one decent fight from the seat. But uh, I've yelled about I've yelled about tough enough. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rehash that. But then that leads us, of course, to the title that has been inactive the longest. The women's bantamweight title, also held by Amanda Nunes, has not been defended for 602 days. Now, Nunes has been active during that period of time. She's defended the featherweight belt. But, and, and part of the reason no one bats an eye about that is, well, you know, the division's not great and Nunes is active. But you'd think that if there were, there's a couple of, if there was ever a time to potentially consider an interim title, there are certain cases, if a champion is injured in particular and you don't know how long the injury is going to take, okay, that's somewhat acceptable. If you have, especially a dual champion like Amanda Nunes, who is bouncing between 135 and 145, depending on the promotion. Amanda does whatever the promotion requires her to do with that particular title. It's those titles. It's, I don't think she has a tremendous amount. She has some say, obviously, but most champions don't, and she doesn't have a, she doesn't have a tremendous amount of say. With Amanda Nunes holding the real belt and kind of bouncing around, you could do an interim title at 135, and it would be what all interim titles are, a glorified number one contender's badge. That's what they are. Uh, I know that's what they are because the UFC will take them away from you willy-nilly without uh, without any real consequence. I mean, I hate to bring up Tony Ferguson again, but that man won an interim title at lightweight, which should not have been an interim title. Should have been the real thing. Uh, there was no re- there was no reason for an interim title at lightweight. Connor was wasting everyone's time with that. But they threw an interim belt there. Tony won it. And then after he blew out his knee, he was stripped of it. And they fought like... And then the real title was contested. It just... They they gave that man a belt. And, the, and then took it away from him. With... Uh, when he had nothing to say about it, right? Like At that point, your belt means... At that point, especially the interim belt, means nothing means absolutely nothing except the amount of extra money it confers upon the interim champion because UFC contracts at this point in time don't differentiate between full champion and interim champion. If you're a champion of any kind, they pay you more. So that's really all that matters. It affects the bottom line of some fighters. But you'd think that women's bantamweight, which is just kind of desperately trying to catch up to Amanda Nunes, could do with an interim title, but no, nary a peep about it. Because of course not. This is just promote. I don't know if there was if there must be contractual. I think there must be contractual language here that the UFC has to put on so many. The, I know the UFC is contracted to put on X number of events for ESPN Plus, and I wouldn't be shocked if that broke down a little bit. Some of them being exclusive, some of them being pay-per-views. You must provide X number of pay-per-views. I don't know how much autonomy the UFC has over determining the static, like what constitutes pay-per-views in this particular respect. I know they want the UFC's general rule of thumb is a you put title fights on a pay-per-view must have a title fight. I don't know. I, I don't agree with this policy. For the record, 
there you can absolutely have some great cards that that are worth the money that do not have a title fight at the top but and i've mentioned this in the past as well if the ufc has some internal data that shows in aggregate if adding a title of some variety to any paper to all your pay-per-views that may not otherwise have them gives you a boost of you know, 0.1 gives you a a small percentage boost over the course of the year, then they're going to do it because there's no down, because there's not a whole lot of downside not to financially. Especially when the vast majority of not just, you can always tell the fighters who know what's up, you know, guys like uh, Cyril Gaon in the lead up to this fight was asked, how are you going to feel about the belt? You know, you've seen some fighters when they win the interim title, they, are very emotional about it. Some don't care. And Gon's response was just, you know, I, I'll be happy to win, but Francis is the champion. This is a, this belt is just, it punches my ticket to fight for the real belt. Or you know, Justin Gaethje famously kind of tossing down the interim title after he beat Tony Ferguson. Just said, when asked, you know, why'd you throw that down? So I'll wait for the real one. You know, there are those people, and then there's others who are. A little bit more, tr- uh, and I'm not here to police fighters' emotions when it comes to stuff like this. If uh, if if they feel great about it, like they're the real champion or whatnot, then hey, you guys are you put yourselves through incredible hardship to fight like this, and you sacrifice years and quality of life on the altar of athletic glory. I'm I'm not going to go. You, you shouldn't feel good about winning an interim title. Uh, I, I, that's just, I have no right whatsoever to, again, police their emotions about it. I'm happy to point out when I think they're wrong about their, (laughs) because emotions can absolutely be wrong, but I'm not going to say you shouldn't, you should feel differently. Just, okay, you feel incorrectly, which is fine. But, uh, so that's that's kind of the preamble to that, uh, stupid interim title. On the plus side... As for the fight itself, Cyril Gaon defeats Derek Lewis via TKO, mostly punches, 4-11 of the third. Guys, this wasn't close. I think they credited Derek Lewis with three landed strikes in the entire first round, and I think that might be generous. I'm not sure I would have given him three. Uh, And... I mean, Lewis landed, I think they... What did they give him? I want to say they gave him 15 for, like, the whole fight. Pull up UFC stats. Uh, For this particular event. Because the numbers were ridiculous. They were... It was absurd. If we look at total strikes... Yeah, Derek Lewis has credited total strikes... With 3 of 11 in the first, whereas Gon was 26 of 35. In round 2, Lewis was 5 of 10. I think that's very generous. Uh, Gon was 23 of 29. And then in the final round, Lewis was 8 of 16. That's probably about right. Things picked up a little bit in the third. And Gon was 49 of 58. I mean, Gon's total... Signif- Gon landed 80% of the strikes he threw. Well, that, that's significant. Hang on. That's probably about the same for his total. His total strikes was what, 112 out of 136. We're still dealing with 80 some, right around the 80% mark. That's ridiculously accurate. That is that is insane to be able to hit someone with that that reliably. Just that, that's a fairly crazy number. Gone was just better every... I mean, I mentioned, I think in the preview for this, this is kind of about the technician against the brawler. And Lewis just had nothing. I mean, he tried a few of his jumping attacks to close distance, but he couldn't do it. Uh, He tried a few rushes, but Lewis doesn't really work... This is one of the flaws in Derek Lewis's game. He doesn't work consistently. And you don't have to, which at heavyweight is kind of a weird thing. 
you don't have to be at a you don't have to have a high pace uh, to be consistently active. You, you, these are very large men. I mean, Gon's, what, 6'4", 247, I think, for this fight? Uh, Lewis is, I think he was 6'3", and then he cuts to 265, so he's probably around 270-ish by the time fight night comes around, depending on how his body is at the moment. These guys are just not going to keep the same pace that a bantamweight or a flyweight or a welter uh, lightweight, any of those lighter guys. They're just not going to keep that kind of pace. It's not really physiologically feasible to be moving around that much mass at that kind of a pace for that period of time. The people who can maintain that kind of a pace are very, very rare. I mean, everyone I know might be going Cain Velasquez. If you can name someone other than Cain, I'd be very surprised. You could maybe... Even Fedor didn't fight. Fedor kept a very high pace for a heavyweight. But I think his level of activity, if you were to drop him down to say middleweight, would be more commensurate with that. But they just don't come along that often, for good reason. But you don't have to be frantic to be consistent. Lewis's lack of activity and just kind of occasionally deciding to throw a blitz or here's something to make you, maybe I'll land something, let me lure you in and try to just swing for the bleachers. It works at heavyweight, but it's not a it's not ideal at all. Look at the rune streak he was on. He got beat up in the first round of that Curtis Blades fight on the feet. I don't know why Blades decided to try and take him down in the second round. Everything that Lewis was doing in that first round was designed around trying to reacting to a shot from Curtis Blades, which left him fairly exposed on the feet to just kind of get picked apart. Uh, I think if Blades had stuck with what he did in the first round, he would have won that fight fairly easily. Alexander Volkov beat the crap out of Derek Lewis until Lewis landed a Hail Mary blow. That's kind of the story of Lewis's career. He's just not a very active fighter in the cage. He tries to pick spots here and there, and for whatever reason. Against Cyril Gaon, that backfired horribly. Gaon spent the entire first round just picking at him. Uh, Gaon opened southpaw, which... The decision, because Gon can fight fairly well from either stance, the decision to fight Southpaw in this case, I think it let his lead leg do a lot of the work. He was kind of flicking out, you know, front kicks to the body, side kicks to the knee and whatnot, just kind of picking at Derek. And then it also kind of lengthens the power hand punch, which is weird because switching your stance doesn't actually really change a tremendous amount of the distance between you. It just kind of changes the geometry of that power hand punch. Uh, it makes you mostly in the footwork. You, know, you have to change how your feet are in relationship to your opponent to make that punch more effective. But it lets you see it the whole way if you're standing opposite stances. It's a pretty solid defensive tactic, and I think that's what he was doing. I mean, he fights southpaw a lot anyway, but in this case in particular, it was just to get a better read on Lewis's right. Which he did, and then in the second round it was a bit more body kicks, some more jabs. He was jabbing Lewis up from either stance. He started throwing leg kicks in the second, and that really seemed to bother Lewis. Uh, by the time the third comes around, he lands a couple of really hard leg kicks, and Lewis can't really hold his stance anymore. Gets backed into the fence, gets hurt with a jab to the eye. Uh, and once gone had Lewis hurt, he just unloaded on him. It was... Uh, when Gon keeps a very, very measured pace, uh, but when he goes, woo boy, that's a scary man when he decides to go. <laughs> uh, this was not close. Um, that first, whenever I do this for live coverage, I tend to try to keep in mind the scoring criteria of the location we're in, and Texas uses the old scoring criteria, which is horrible and needs to be updated. I I don't know enough about the specifics of the Texas... What's the... Are they the Texas... No, it's the New Jersey Athletic Control Board. I don't think in Texas... The, I don't think it's the Texas State Athletic Commission. They have a different name, but what point being, whatever regulatory body is in place in Texas, I don't know the specifics of the process for changing the rules, uh, but you really need to, guys. Seriously. Um... 
the new scoring criteria, if nothing else, is it's still not perfect and it still leads to problems, but it is vastly superior to the old scoring criteria. That needs to be addressed. Uh, under the new scoring criteria, that first round's a borderline 10-8. Uh, kind of ditto the second. So it, th this is not a close fight at all. At all, at all, at all. Uh, Gon is now your interim champion. Gon versus Nganu should take place at some point before the end of the year, barring unforeseen complications. I am very much looking forward to Francis Ngannou and Cyril Gon. Francis has... Because it might be very easy to look at this fight and go, well, this is what Cyril Gon will just do to Francis Ngannou. Francis is not Derek Lewis. Um, I think Francis is a bit more technically sound. And if his last fight was any indication, Francis was pretty good about being patient. Uh, which is something he needed to work on a little bit. But he's... I mean, both men have power. I think there's a couple of things Francis does better than Derek Lewis. I think his setups are better. So he's better at delivering his power than Derek Lewis's. Derek Lewis just kind of swings and hopes. Uh, especially the later a fight gets. It's just, let me draw you in until I think you're in punching range and then swing. And Ganu doesn't quite do that. He's a little bit better about setting his stuff up. But how is a big power striker like Nganu going to match up with a very fleet of foot, uh, very distance-minded? Uh, man, Gan's disruption of Lewis's rhythm and timing was great. He was splitting timing pretty frequently. That's a big problem. Uh, if you fight someone who's good at doing that, it is the most frustrating thing in the world. You can't even step. Like, you start to take a step, and they're splitting the timing with which you are moving. And it's really annoying. It's even... And I mean, I'm not a small guy. I'm 6'1", 220. But it's annoying when I fight people, you know, my size or lighter. Most of the people I spar with at the moment are lighter than I am. It's a small gym. Someone the size of Gon doing it has just got to be hell on earth. Like, <laughs> how do you deal with that? Uh... He's good about... Cyril Gunn is... He's dangerous. He can finish you. But he's really good about winning rounds. And he's good about making... He is good about taking away your offense. Uh, or even if he doesn't really take it away, he's good about making you fight his fight. And there's not many people that can fight... I mean... The man's undefeated. He's 10-0 as a professional. He had, I forget how many amateur fights, he had some uh, Muay Thai, like, I don't think he's lost in any combat sport that he's fought, uh, professional or amateur. I might be wrong about that, but I think. And he's, so no one can beat him thus far fighting him on his terms. I don't know that there are many heavyweights in the UFC or in the world, quite frankly, that could fight Cyril Gaon on Gaon's terms and come out the better. And making him fight on somewhat on your terms is not something anyone's been able to force on him consistently yet. Is Francis the guy to do that? Maybe. Anyone the size of Francis with his power is never going to... You, know, you, you discount Nganu's chances of winning a fight at your peril. You might not favor him, but that man can always... He always has the possibility of winning. I... I think Gon poses some real problems for Francis. Um, his technique is superior. I don't think that's much of a. I don't think that's too much of a controversial statement. I think Gon's better over distance. And I don't just mean physical space between them. I mean as the longer the fight goes. We've never seen in Gon. The only time he had to fight long was when he lost against Stipe Miocic. And. We don't know how well Nganu's power carries later into a fight. We've seen him get, you know, some, some later stoppages, but it's been a while. And the, there's a world of difference between the third round and the fifth round. Just a world of difference. 
So I, I very much look forward to that fight. That's going to be that's going to be a heck of a fight. And I might I might even lean towards gone just a little bit, which which might just be personal bias. I tend to favor more technically proficient fighters, but uh, who, I'll have to give that I'll have to give that a lot more thought once we when that fight gets closer. But at the moment, uh, Cyril Gon is that man is absolutely one of the best heavyweights in the world. There's no dispute. He is a remarkable fighter, especially for heavyweight. To fight the way that he does, kind of measured, but he's good about pressuring you. I mean, I made the comparison to uh, Stephen Thompson, I think, last week. Not, And it's not one-to-one, but if you want a kind of basic understanding of some of the problems he presents, a guy who can switch stances, who's really good about footwork and angles, who's good about picking at you, there's a lot of different ways to apply pressure. It's not always going to be going forward. It can, that's the easiest way to understand it. You can pressure someone backing up. It's not as easy. You have to. There's a lot more fainting that goes into that. You're trying to pressure them into doing things. But even then, most people, if they're coming forward a lot, there's a real kind of give and take rhythm to fighting. And people who come forward a lot will, if they land something good or if they get hit. Uh, if they feel that kind of that kind of switch, they might start backing up, or maybe they just want to give you a different look. Uh, either way, if you're and Stephen Thompson is very good about this, he's very good about keeping pressure on you through either moving forward or if you're coming forward, he's still kind of throwing at you or fainting at you and making you think, making you work, making you do stuff. Gon's got a little bit of that. Some of Gon's weapon choices remind me a bit of John Jones. Uh, he uses a lot of those kicks to the leg to kind of poke at you and disrupt you and set things up. Uh, he's good about elbows. Uh, he landed some really nice elbows against uh, Derek Lewis. He had one combo, I think, in the second. Might have been in the third, one of the two. They were in the clinch, and he kind of dips down and throws in <laughs> what in my tradition, my, uh, my martial arts tradition, is we call it an obscure back elbow. It's the same kind of elbow that Yair Rodriguez knocked out uh, Chan Sung Jung with. He throws that, kind of bumps. Uh, Lu- he catches Lewis more with his triceps than the elbow, but he hits that uh, from a little bit. Again, his posture's he's a little bit doubled over to kind of facilitate that elbow. Then he comes up straight and just throws a right kind of slicing elbow to the head. Like, same arm, just throws that to kind of stand him up, comes up right, bla- uh, cracks him with it in the head. Really nice sequence. Uh, Gon is absolutely a handful for everyone in that weight class. Absolutely. Doesn't mean he's never going to lose, but that man is... He is a handful. He is very much an elite heavyweight fighter. So, uh, him and Francis, going to be a heck of a fight when it happens. Uh, As for Derek Lewis... uh, Derek Lewis has fought just about everyone there is at heavyweight. Bring up the rankings real fast. Now, these obviously have not been updated yet. Uh, but he's fought Curtis Blades. He's fought Volkov. I don't think he's... Has he fought... I don't think he's fought Rosenstrike. But he's fought Abdurakhimov. I believe he's fought Tabora. I think he's even fought... We have a quick look through Lewis's... Uh, career here. Yeah, Blades, he's fought Olenek, Latifi, Ivanov, Volkov, and Ganu. Yeah, there's Tabora, there's Abdurakhimov. So he hasn't fought Rosenstrike yet. That might be... That might be the fight to make. I think... I think Rosenstrike has a fight coming up. But I might be mistaken about that. Um, he hasn't fought Sakai. That's a thought. Yeah, Chris Dawk is coming up in the world... He's sitting at number 10. But there are a few fights for him, but... I mean, Lewis... Lewis has been in the UFC since... How long, man? Since 2014. And he's been there a while. He's been there for a while. And, you know, has won a lot more than he's lost. 
And I'm not here to, you know, I'm not criticizing the man in that respect. But when you're around for a while, you wind up fighting, you know, the majority of people there. Uh, can I just say also, just real fast, um, I think it was Chael Sonnen on the desk for this. N not the, uh, one of the desks. It might have been Chael on the desk. Chael said it. I'm 90%. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's certain of this. Chael said at some point, you know, Derek Lewis has never been dropped or finished, which is just blatantly not true. Uh, in fact, his fi every loss in the UFC, he's been finished. Matt Mitrio knocked him out. Sean Jordan TKO'd him with a hook kick. Uh, Mark Hunt bludgeoned him and stopped him. Cormier submitted him. JDS stopped him with strikes. Like that, It was just asinine. It was just an absolutely asinine statement. But so Lewis and, again, Rosenstriker Dawkins, somewhere along that line is probably what's next for him, but... I don't know. Lewis is the kind of guy you're happy to have on the roster. He has a good relationship with the fans. He wins more than he loses, and he's he's never going to be champion. I don't. I'm. I feel pretty confident saying that at this point. But he's a. If you get to a point where someone is never going to be champion, or deeply, deeply unlikely. I don't think calling them a gatekeeper is... When I say he's probably going to wind up as a heavyweight gatekeeper, I don't mean that as an insult. I mean that he's a very stiff test for anyone who wants to kind of hit the top of heavyweight. You look at the guys he's beaten, he's beaten some talented guys. And if you look at the guys he's lost to, you know, some of them were just bad matchups. I mean, you know, Sean Jordan at that point in time, like you know, years ago. Uh, Mark Hunt beat him, and Mark Hunt, phew, he's not with the UFC anymore, but Mark Hunt was nobody's easy fight. Nobody's. Uh, the loss to JDS was kind of a bad one. I mean, Junior had one foot out the door of the UFC at that point, and then... But he's he's a valuable addition to the roster as a general rule, so he'll probably be around until he really starts hitting a skid. So, that was your main event. Let's see. Uh, Komain. Pretty good fight here, actually. Jose Aldo defeats Pedro Munoz via unanimous decision, 30-27 across the board. Uh, okay. Let me start with this. If you're a little bit curious how you can deal with calf kicks, watch Jose Aldo in this fight because he shuts them down fairly quickly. It's not Checking calf kicks is not the easiest thing, partially due to how most people stand in MMA. It's a subtlety of stance difference. But look at Aldo. He's a little bit more upright. And anytime, uh, anytime Munoz throws one at him, he does a couple of things. He does them very quickly because he's Jose Aldo and is kind of an athletic freak. He picks the leg up, but he doesn't pick... The leg itself does not elevate, which is what most people do when they're checking leg kicks. Especially if you're trying to check one to the thigh. You bring the leg up, you point the knee out, and you let them run into your shin head on, or your knee. Because your knee is going to be stronger than their shin the vast majority of the time. He just does like a leg curl, if you've ever done your hamstring curls. He brings his heel up that way. He still turns the foot, turns the hip out, so that uh, Munoz's shin is is not kind of going into the softer tissue or just into the ankle at that uh, that kind of side angle. It's going straight on to his shin, which is one of the ways to check them. You have to turn that out so it's shin to shin. And it sucks because you, their shin slamming into your shin is a painful experience. Uh, if you want another example of that one in particular, uh, Ural Romero and Luke Rockhold. Anytime Rockhold kind of tried to throw that calf kick, Romero just turned his he turned his hip and his foot out so that Rockhold's shin crashed not into his calf, but into his shin. And it dissuaded Rockhold from throwing those. And Luke Rockhold's a very powerful kicker. Aldo, in this case, he would turn the hip out just a little bit and then would just leg curl. And it largely took that weapon away. Now, some of that's the speed differential. Pedro Munoz is not an especially fast bantamweight, whereas Jose Aldo... Jose Aldo's speed is still remarkable. 
uh, even after all these years. <laughs> Aldo just was the better fighter. He threw a few leg kicks later in the fight. Not a lot, but a few. He jabbed up Munoz. He hit him to the body uh, a lot. You, uh, Aldo, excuse me. Aldo's become a lot more reliant on his boxing lately, but it's working for him. His defense was good. I don't think Munoz hit him all that cleanly pretty much at all in this fight. He's slipping, he's countering. He came out for the third round with a really nice flurry. He went body to head. The, the third round of this fight in particular was quite good. Uh, this was a great performance from Jose Aldo, who's... I don't know what it would take for him to get into the title picture. Probably at least one more win. But... Can we just take a minute and appreciate Jose Aldo? For... Let me just start with this, as far as Aldo goes. Jose Aldo's professional debut took place August 10th, 2004. That's the year I graduated from high school. This man has been fighting for a, for a really long time, almost 20 years. And he, he debuted in the WEC, so he stepped to the highest level available in 2008. I mean, this is a real throwback, but if you don't remember him, what a big deal it was for him to beat Alexandre Frank, uh, Franco Noguera, that guy was the best, was kind of regarded as the best featherweight in the world. He was, a, uh, if not the best, certainly one of uh I think Faber might have been the champion at that point in time, but there, there was a bit of a debate around, you know, purists whether or not you know, where Noguera ranked. Uh, uh, his nickname was Pequeno, and uh, he was kind of the man. He'd had a few, he'd had a few setbacks. His record wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but he was a, he was certainly very, very well regarded, and. Jose Aldo beat the brakes off of him, man. He abused Jonathan Brookins. His Aldo's run from his WEC debut until he lost the belt. So, 08 until 2015. Is one of the singularly best runs you will find in MMA history. Just read it for you real fast if you're curious. There was the aforementioned Noguera, Jonathan Brookins... Uh, Rolando Perez, Chris Mickey, Cub, he smashed Cub Swanson. In, that fight should have been over way before. It was only lasted eight seconds officially. It was over way before that. He came out of the blocks and hit Cub Swanson with a flying double knee attack, and we were done. Took the that ref. That was a slow stoppage from that ref. Like that was a five second fight, if that. He smashed Cub Swanson. He stopped Mike Brown in two, in six and a half minutes to win the featherweight title. He abused Uriah Faber for five rounds. He knocked out Manny Gamburian in, again, six and a half minutes. He beat Mark Hominick. He beat Kenny Florian. He knocked out Chad Mendez with a buzzer beater in the first round. He outclassed Frankie Edgar. He beat Chan Sung Jung. He beat Ricardo Lamas. His second fight with Chad Mendez, UFC 179, still one of the best fights you will ever, ever see. That run is, in and of itself, legendary. And I don't use that term lightly. Jose Aldo is one of the all-time greats. Crazy thing about the Connor fight, not just the loss, but because he rebounded from that with a beautiful performance beating Frankie Edgar again. But a, a funny statistic about that fight for both him and McGregor. Post UFC 194, Jose Aldo's record is 5-5. Five and 6-5 five. Uh, and five now, I think. No, no, no now it's 5-5. Five and five. So Aldo, post that fight, beats Frankie Edgar, loses to Max Holloway twice, beats Jeremy Stevens, beats Anato Moicano, finishes both of them, loses to Alexander Volkanovsky, clear, clear loss, Fights Marlon Marais to a split decision loss that I scored it for Marais, but I don't argue with anyone that scored that for Aldo. Gets a title shot off of that and has three good rounds against Peter Yan. At the end of those first three rounds, I was 29-28 Yan, but I saw a lot of people that were 29-28 Aldo. 
Then the fourth round is clearly yawns, and then the fifth is just a beating. Uh, that goes on way, way too long. But rebounds from that with wins over Marlon Vera and Pedro Munoz. Aldo is 5-5 five and five since that fight. Conor McGregor is in MMA 3-4 and four since knocking out Jose Aldo. He beat Nate Diaz, he beat Eddie Alvarez, and he beat Cowboy Cerrone, and that's it. That that was a that fight that one fight at 194. They those two men have taken very very divergent, very interestingly interestingly divergent paths. Uh, you know, Aldo to go down a weight class. I mean, if you weren't around when he was featherweight king, he had some really tough weight cuts to make 145. The talk was always of him trying his hand at 155. That was always kind of the thought was what if he went up? What if he didn't have to you know, have these serious weight cuts and everything. Well, he went down. And to arguably the best weight class in the in the entire sport is bantamweight. And I said a couple of weeks ago, I don't know that bantamweight is top to bottom the best weight class in all of MMA. I think 155 might still be deeper if we go you know, worldwide. But bantamweight is... Not only does it always deliver, there are occasionally boring lightweight fights. Not only does bantamweight always, pretty much always deliver, bantamweight is the bleeding edge of innovation in mixed martial arts. It's not that there's no innovation elsewhere. I'm not at all trying to say that. But you look at what guys are doing at 135, and they're the ones that are experiment they're the ones that are experimenting they're the ones pushing the boundaries a lot more so than any other weight class he went down to that weight class fought to a I guess, split decision with one of the best guys in the world then lost to the best guy in the world but marlon vera is nobody's easy fight and pedro munoz was one of the he was ranked number nine coming into this i seem to recall I mean, if we look at Munoz's last couple of fights, he lost to Aljamain Sterling. That was pretty clear. I thought he beat Frankie Edgar. Straight up. I scored that fight for him. I I will die on that hill. That's a hill I'll die on. Then he beat Jimmy Rivera. Uh, Munoz is a very, very good, deserving... Re- he deserves to be ranked, certainly, and I don't object to his spot in the top ten. And he'll probably drop coming coming off of this loss, but... He was of he's certainly one of the best bantamweights. I think he's one of the best bantamweights in the world. And Jose Aldo shut him down and beat him it, decisively. The the only round I think that I saw people go in eh, that was a little bit close was the first, and I disagree with the people saying that. Aldo is what 34? Yeah, he's 34. He's younger than I am. He's been fighting for, again, almost 20 years, 17-ish. Next month, it'll be 17 years that man's been fighting against the best for almost that entire time. And he has been beating the best (laughs) for the vast majority of his career. And he's still getting it done in the most advanced division the sport has to offer. And I will say that about bantamweight, and I will say that with conviction. You want to argue which division's deeper all around, that or lightweight? That's a debate that can be had. I don't think lightweight is top to bottom as sophisticated a division as bantamweight. Bantamweight is where, bantamweight is the future. There was a time when that wasn't the case. There was a t- there was in fact a period of time when other d- there were other weight classes that were the ones you looked at to see the innovation, to see what was coming down the pike. It's bantamweight now and has been for a, has been for a while. That's the division where things get tested. That's the division where things are innovated and explored. You don't see guys doing switch hitting like they do at bantamweight. You will. But you don't see you don't see footwork patterns like you do at bantamweight and other weight classes. You don't see the blending of striking and wrestling. It that's that's the most sophisticated division 
on average, in the sport. And Jose Aldo, the old dog, is out there fighting other, fighting top-ranked bantamweights and giving them hell even if he loses. Okay, the Yawn fight, he didn't really give Yawn hell, but he hurt Yawn's leg with leg kicks. And if that's only a three-round fight, I think that's a... I can't remember what the official scorecards were for that. But it, I think at least one of the official judges had three had the rounds three to two for Aldo. All right. Jose Aldo is a remarkable fighter. And I know he's not everyone's favorite, and I'm not here to sell you on his personality or sell you as a, to be a fan of his. I'm, that's not my pitch here. But whatever you think about him personally... And whether you root for the man or not, let's take a minute to appreciate what he has accomplished and what he is still accomplishing. Because it's, it is absolutely remarkable. You don't see people that do what he does very often. So, a metaphorical tip of the cap to Joe Zialdo. And if I was wearing a hat right now, I would absolutely tip it to him. Uh... I think Aldo mentioned he wanted to call out TJ Dillashaw next. I that whether or not that one great fight. Start with that. Two. If that fight materializes, it will be a product of timing more than anything else. By all rights, Dillashaw is going to get the next title shot, and I don't object to that. Even though, look, I thought he lost the Sandhagen fight. I. I frankly don't understand the argument for scoring that fight for Dillashaw. I really don't. I... Yeah, I, I just don't get that argument, but that's... I mean, l let me leave that... Set that aside. Let me leave that alone. Dillashaw... If he wants to sit out for his for the title shot, that's going to be his choice. It's going to be his gamble, really. We don't know what... Yawn and Sterling 2 is going to look like. If the winner of that fight comes out banged up, uh, whoever happens to win, I've said this before, my inclination is Yawn. It, but whoever wins, if they come out of that fight really banged up, uh, I don't know how long TJ will be willing to sit on the sidelines and potentially have someone pass him by. Just a thought. So, some of that's a product of timing. If whoever wins out of... If Sterling and Yon ends quickly, or in a fashion where one guy comes out fairly unscathed, even if they go the distance, that might be a faster turnaround, possibly. In which case, Aldo will have to fight somebody else. But you know, would you object to Jose Aldo and Corey Sandhagen? I mean, I wouldn't. Uh, who, else is, who else would kind of be appropriate there? Uh, you got Rob Font. Aldo and Font would be kind of awesome, wouldn't it? Uh, I mean, I've said this for a while. You know, now might be the right time to make the, the old WEC super fight between Jose Aldo and Dominic Cruz. I don't know Cruz's health status at the moment or if that's a fight he'd be interested in, but... I, you've got three pretty solid options. If Dillashaw doesn't wind up wanting to wait... Then Dillashaw and Aldo is not the worst fight in the world. If Sandhagen and Aldo want to fight as Sandhagen's kind of rebound, you've got Aldo and Font would be a technical masterpiece, perhaps, given how technical both of those guys are. And Aldo and Cruz is maybe not the most relevant fight at the top of the division, but it's kind of a dream fight. You know, one of those that kind of floated around for a while when Cruz was the bantamweight king. And Aldo was the featherweight king, and there's, you know, how would that look? You've got a guy in Aldo with great technical proficiency, great defense, solid leg kicks, and Cruz, a very elusive, movement-based, kind of push-the-pace uh, wrestle boxer. And I don't mean a wrestle boxer in the way that, you know, Uriah Faber or Chad Mendes are wrestle punchers. I mean, Cruz takes the boxing portion of that very seriously. I... I don't think you can go wrong with any of that. So, Bantamweight's still kind of in a holding pattern to see what happens with Yon and Sterling. 
I mean, Font just, you know, tuned up Cody Garbrandt. For, and tuned up's a bit of an exaggeration, but he just beat Cody Garbrandt over five rounds. So he's in a prime position. There's a lot of guys with very good claims to being in the title picture at Bantamweight. So. And Aldo is right back in that kind of proximity with this win. And again, at his age, with his miles, yeah, you know what? Good on him. That is genuinely a remarkable feat. All right, next up. Oh, man. Vicente Luque defeats Michael Chiesa via Darce Choke submission 325 of the first round. I can't remember which way I leaned last week. I think I leaned towards Chiesa. I think I did. Um, but man, Vicente Luque. I mentioned this before. That man has a grand total of three losses in the UFC. One was his UFC debut. Then he lost to Leon Edwards and Steven Thompson. And that's it. He is, I believe at this point, 14-2 and two in his last 16 fights. So you have the losses to Edwards and Wonderboy. And he has won 14 other fights. And he has finished most of those. Uh, he's on a four-fight winning streak now. Yeah. Nico Price, Randy Brown, Tyron Woodley, Michael Chiesa. Finished all of them. Uh, before that, he lost to Thompson. And then if we're, if we're going backwards now, Mike Perry, split decision, shouldn't have been split. Derek Krantz finished him. Brian Barberina finished him. That was a great fight, by the way. Jalen Turner knocked him out. Chad Laprise knocked him out. First fight with Nico Price, taps him out. Then prior to that, the loss to Bilal Muhammad. Or sorry, the loss to Leon Edwards. Before that, knocks out Bilal Muhammad. You know how hard it is to knock out Bilal Muhammad? He did it. And then prior to that, it was Hector Urbina, Alvaro Herrera, and Hader Hassan. All of those were finishes. I said this last week, I think. Th there was a trio of guys who were severely under, are severely underappreciated as welterweight talents. Santiago Ponzinibbio, Vicente Luque, and Alexis Lesky Dos Santos. Those guys had long... Uh, in the case of Ponzinibbio, his momentum stalled a little bit due to injury and travel restrictions at times. Like he... And that poor guy was supposed to fight Robbie Lawler, and that would have been a heck of a fight, and I think he would have won. But that fight never kind of materialized. Uh, Ponzinibbio looked okay in his last fight, kind of rebounded. But those three guys were guys who barely were kept outside the top ten for the most part. And it was pretty darn obvious nobody ranked above them really wanted to fight them. And... You can't, at this point, you can't deny Vicente Luque. Not with his record. Not with what he's done in his last four fights. He submitted Tyron Woodley in the first round. They had a barn burner. Here, Michael Chiesa, there wasn't a whole lot before there was everything in this fight. You know, Luque landed a couple of decent punches, and then Chiesa went, okay, enough of this. And shot on him, got him down. Luke gave his back, and I thought we were done. Chiesa is a not only a great back taker, has great back control. It's uh, it, it's his bread and butter. It's what he does. And <laughs> he never, critically, Luke never let Chiesa get a second hook in. If that had happened, I think he would have been toast. Or at the very least, in a really bad spot for the rest of that round. But he never let... You never let Chiesa get the second hook in. Chiesa still had a choke that kind of got close. But Luque was able to kind of turn into him, get on top. Chiesa threatened an arm bar to kind of force more movement. Luque defended. And then as Chiesa rolls to his knees to get up, likes, like lightning, like, like that. Darce choke from Luque. And Chiesa fights it as long as he can and then has to tap out. People, I, I, I tweeted this, and it's, it's true. Vicente Luque's front headlock sequence is lights out good. People forget about it 
because they're worried about his striking game, which is very, very good. And you argue, I can't say more dangerous, but his striking game is what gets a lot more of the headlines. But if you look down the list of what he's done, his first two wins in the UFC were submissions due to front to front headlock chokes. He got Hader Hassan with an anaconda and then Alvaro Herrera with a darce. He darced Nico Price the first time. Then he went on a long sequence of uh, either decisions or uh, strike stoppage. And then Darces Woodley, Darces Chiesa. If we go back earlier in his career, his pre-UFC stuff. Uh, got a guillotine choke win. Another anaconda choke. It, what that man does from the front headlock position is... It, it's lights out, man. You can, If he gets you in that position, you cannot play. You've got to break his grip. you got to get two on one. You've got to get your head out. You you can't play around there with him. Uh, in that position, he is... He'll take... He will just choke you. He will strangle you. Doesn't really matter. You could take the best jujitsu guy in the world. I don't really care who you think it is. You let you put them in a position where Luke has that front headlock and they're in trouble. Best guy in the world. Again, I, whether you think whoever you think it is. That position Luke has a lot of mastery over, and he will. Uh, and Kiesa just slipped by the slightest of margins. If there's, he could have done that exact same sequence, Kiesa, against the vast majority of that division and not wound up in this position. But because it was Luke, he got caught. Uh, Luke, after the fact, said he wants a shot at the belt. I don't think that's forthcoming. But... Luke has a pretty singular advantage over the other people at the top of welterweight. If we look at the top of welterweight at the moment, you have champion Kamaru Usman, then you have Colby Covington, Gilbert Burns, Leon Edwards, Stephen Thompson, Michael Chiesa, Vicente Luque. Luque will at least swap Chiesa to number five. Of those people, Kamaru Usman has beaten most of them. I mean, I've said this about the entire you know, kind of top of that division. Covington, Usman has beaten him. Burns, Usman has beaten him. Thompson, they haven't fought. I th- I don't think he's beaten Kiesa either. So that, that was actually one of the things about Kiesa. Uh, he was a fresh matchup. Luke Aid, they haven't fought. Masvidal beat him. Magni, I'm pretty sure he beat him. Uh, it, this isn't quite the same problem it used to be, but there was a... Usman's just beaten most of the top contenders. And the top contenders that he hasn't beaten tend not to be able to beat the guys that he has beaten. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a problem. But, so, Lucas should be due a big fight next. Um, you know, based on how both men fight stylistically, Luque and Jorge Masvidal, tell me that wouldn't be a, tell me that wouldn't be a heck of a fight. You can't, you can't tell me that wouldn't be a, a heck of a fight. I don't even know who I... I, would, I think I might lean towards Luke, but it'd be a great fight. Uh, you've just you got a bit of a logjam at the moment. You've got Edwards, who by all rights should be fighting for the belt, but who the UFC just... Put it this way. The UFC is not going to go out of their way to accommodate Leon Edwards. And Leon Edwards has not done himself a tremendous amount of favors with the, uh, in terms of getting the public interested in him. Now he, sh- like I said, he should be getting the shot instead of Colby, hundred percent. I, that that's my, I said that when they made the fight. That is still my stance. By merit, Edwards should be fighting Kamar Usman instead of Colby Covington. But. If your only claim to a title shot in the UFC is "look at my wins," you don't re- you don't really have much of a claim. They have ignored that time and time again because they can. So we'll have to wait and see. But whoever Luke fights next, it should be a pretty big deal. 
He should be fighting... His next fight should probably be a title eliminator, if nothing else. So, good for, Lu good for Luke, man. Finally getting people... To, forcing people to pay attention to him. They should have been for a while. You know, I've been singing that man's praises for quite some time. Because he's a really good fighter who should have been ranked higher than he has been for, long, for a fairly long period of time. Uh, as for Kiesa, I think he'll bounce back from this. This was his first loss ever at welterweight. I, I think he'll rebound. He's still a big problem for that division, man. A real big problem. Uh, okay, Tisha Torres defeated Angela Hill via unanimous decision. 230-27s, 129-28. <sighs> This is just a bad fight for Angela Hill, man. Torres, most of what Torres does stifles what Hill does very effectively. Uh, this was Torres out pointing Hill consistently over the course of the fight. Uh, Hill never got into this. Uh, almost never. So, good on Torres. I She'll probably be due a decent enough fight next. She was ranked. Uh, what was she ranked coming into this? Uh, she was number 10 coming into this. She'll probably wind up fighting someone. Uh, who should she fight? Who has she fought? Let me double check this. Is it, you don't want to do too many rebound uh, you know, rematches here. Um, hmm. She could maybe fight... She could fight Nina Nunes. Uh, you know, the former Nina Anson, fight Nina, uh, so Nina Nunes might be a, might be a possibility. Um, I think McKenzie, I think both Mackenzie Dern and Marina Rodriguez are do bigger fights. Claudia, maybe? Uh, give it another couple of, you have to give this another few events to let a few other fights sort out, but... Someone, someone nearer the top is what is probably what Torres is do. Uh, you know, credit to Torres for gutting through a really. Oh yeah, she already lost to Rodriguez. She lost to Tor. Already lost to Rodriguez. Yeah, I, I think Nina Nunes. Possibly. What's Jan Shonan up to? Does she have a fight? I need to see if she has a fight coming up. Um, cause Jan, Jan's coming off of that loss to Esparza. Yeah, actually, you know what? I I might go with Jan Shonan and Tisha Torres. Uh, I I might. I, I, Jan's currently ranked number four. So it would be a that's a chunk, and I don't I don't know who Mackenzie Dern is fighting next, but Dern should be fighting somebody near. You know, there's there's movement that has to happen here, so we might have to wait for a few more relevant fights to take place before things sort themselves out. But yeah, women's strawweight is a very good division, and kicking off the main card, uh, Song Yudong defeats Casey Kenny via split decision. It was 129-28 for Kenny. That's what they came up with live. I'm not. Of all the fights on this card that I scored, I think this is the one I was probably the most wrong about. I'll have to rewatch it. Um, then 129-28 for Song and a 30-27 for Song. Uh, Song did a really good job of kind of letting Kenny come to him and then intercepting him. And there was a lot of that. Stopping the takedowns for the most part. Song's power punches were a problem. So it was... Uh, Good enough win for Song. It didn't... Uh, this didn't really speak to me the way it did to others, so I, maybe I was just having a weird stretch of time. But Song is... When did he drop to Bantamweight? Because he's normally... Does he normally fight at Featherweight? He had a Featherweight fight. Huh. I no, I think he's nor I think he is normally a uh, bantam white. Hmm. Anyway, uh, songs a 
a relevant player at bantamweight. He's got power. He's got very good takedown defense. He's he's a problem. He's a real problem at bantamweight. So that was your main card. Uh, I think the only sort of dud was Torres in Hill, but you know, I might even then that wasn't a bore. That wasn't a bad fight. Just more suffered by comparison to the rest of the card than anything else. Uh, as for the rest of this card, as for the prelims, your fight of the night, Rafael Fiziev defeated Bobby Green via unanimous decision, 130-27, which I can't understand. 229 I was 29-28 Fiziev. He is the rightful winner of this fight. He won the first two rounds. I do not know what that other judge was watching to score the third round for Fiziev. The third round was pretty clearly Bobby Green's. Giving that last round to Fiziev is the product of a deranged mind. That That's just ridiculous. That is just ridiculous. But this fight, this was fight of the night. This is on the short list for fight of the year. This was beautiful. You had the first couple of rounds. You had great defense from both men. Great you know, shoulder rolls, head movement, trunk movement. Fazeev kept a pretty high pace, landed kicks to the leg, to the body. I mean, both men evading. Fazeev just kind of getting the better of the first two rounds, especially with his punches and keeping a higher pace. Third round, Bobby Green finally gets a read on the range. He's able to kind of stifle a lot of the kicking distance from Fazeev. Roll and counter better, lands his punches, gets Fazeev on the back foot. If you look up one fight from this card, this is the fight. This was this was fighting heaven, right? This was this was brilliant. This was beautiful. This was great stuff from both men. This was a great, great fight. Uh, kudos to Fazeev for winning. Kudos to Green for coming on strong late. Great fight. Fazeev's a he's a real problem at lightweight. He's gonna be he's gonna be a handful, a real handful for guys at that weight class. Uh, also at bantamweight, Vince Morales defeated Draco Rodriguez via unanimous decision, 130-27 to 29-28. Uh, I might have disagreed with this one. I might have disagreed with that this one, but uh, or. I see. If I scored it for Rodriguez, it was by the slightest of margins, and I don't disagree with Morales winning. Might be a, uh, my brain might not. I might be misremembering this. Um, either way, Morales. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna be hung up on that mentally. I have no issue with Morales winning. One way. Point being, I have no issue with Morales winning. The 30-27 might have been a little bit, eh, but. Decent performance out of Morales. Um, this was probably the worst fight of the night, but if this was your worst fight, you're having a darn good night. No, no, sorry. The, this fight was the worst fight. Alonzo Manafield defeated Ed Herman via unanimous decision. 30-27 across the board. Ed Herman still kicking around, man. Um, this fight wasn't very close. Manafield was able to land some calf kicks and really messed Ed Herman up. Beat him up along the fence line. Just Herman had very little for this. I'm, I just need to say this about Ed Herman. The man's 40. Ed Herman debuted in the UFC. You guys may not remember this. Or you may not have been around. I was. He was in the finals of the middleweight tournament. The middleweight side of the bracket for the Ultimate Fighter Season 3. This was Shamrock and Ortiz. In 2006... That's when Kendall Grove debuted in the UFC. If you need a different sort of context for this, the relevant champions in the UFC at that time were Tim Sylvia, Chuck Liddell, uh, Rich Franklin, don't know why I blanked on his name, Rich Franklin, and uh, Matt Hughes. Yeah, would have been Matt Hughes, because GSP... GSP was one of the coaches on the fourth season. And that was... Uh, fourth season was the comeback season, which had a slightly different format. Uh, and he would go on to beat Hughes for the belt after that. And there was no UFC lightweight champion. 
The UFC did not have the lightweight division at that point in time. That's how long Ed Herman's been around. So, 2006. And he's still kind of kicking around. Uh, and that man has had a lot of ups and downs. A lot of ups and downs. And here, yeah, he was just way outclassed by Menafield. Uh, let's see. Jessica Penne defeated Karolina Kovalkiewicz via armbar 432 of the first. Uh, boy, Kovalkiewicz, man. She has not been able to... She has not been able to find her footing. She was undefeated. Go, uh, went into the fight with Rosna, with excuse me with Joanna and Jacek and had very little for Joanna. Got submitted by Claudia Gedalia in three minutes. Rebounded okay with a couple of wins. Then Jessica Andras knocked her out. Since then, uh, then she lost to Michelle Waterson, lost to Alexa Grosso, lost to Jan Shaunan, and now got submitted by Jessica Penne. I don't know what's up with her, but she needs to figure some stuff out pretty badly. Uh Let's see, as for the, that, that's the, that was the, uh, that was half the prelims, the early prelims. Manel Cape knocked out Ode Osborne with a flying knee and punches, 444 of the first. Uh, Cup missed weight for this fight, he weighed 129. Never a good look. But he finally gave the kind of performance, not just finish, but overall performance that those of us who watched him when he was in places like Ryzen, we knew he was capable of this, so good to see him finally show up. Now just make weight, buddy. Uh, Miles Johns defeated Anderson Dos Santos via knockout uh, punch, 116 of the third. Johns was winning this fight all the way and then finally was able to land something that put Dos Santos down. Beautiful finishing sequence. He chopped Dos Santos up with calf kicks, uh, started digging to the body, did the old left hook to the body, right hook to the head combo. And just finally found the right angle for it. Knocked, knocked Dos Santos out, so good on Johns. Uh, Melissa Gatto defeated Val, uh, Victoria, excuse me, Victoria Leonardo via TKO. There's a doctor stoppage between rounds two and three. Um, something in the second round, some part of a grappling exchange, I think, uh, caused a break in Leonardo's right arm. This was on the forearm, kind of close to the wrist. And she complained about it between rounds, said, I can't close my hand. Uh, she was willing to try and fight through it, so I, I credit her toughness. But the doctor came in to double check on everything, uh, felt around down there and went, no, I can feel a break. Now, if if there's a break, stopping the fight is correct. That is absolutely the correct thing to do. So kudos. So I, I credit to the doctor doing the right thing. Decent enough win for Gatto, who ended a almost three-year layoff. Uh, was it two? A long layoff. Uh, just due to travel restrictions and whatnot. She, cause she was on the Contender Series. I can't remember if it was 18 or 19, but one of those two. And then just hasn't been able to get a fight since. So good for her. And then kicking everything off at Bantamweight again. Johnny Munoz Jr. defeated Jamie Simmons via rear naked choke, 235 for the second. Uh, Munoz, better, pretty much everywhere. Uh, once he got the back, it was pretty much over. His back control is quite good. Uh, Simmons just fell behind in the hand fighting, and Munoz got his neck, choked him out. All she wrote. Uh, your bonuses, for whatever value for whatever value you individually place on these. Fight of the night, Fazeev and Green. Performances of the night, uh, Cyril Gan, Vicente Luque, Jessica Penne, and Miles Johns. I have no issues with that. Those all seem very fair. Um, is there anyone I would have added? Think about that for just a second. Uh, I, I think the only... They didn't, so Gato didn't get one. Cop was ineligible. Munoz. Eh, okay, I can, I can see that. A uh, little bit generous with the performances, you know, giving out four of them, but no issues with those gentlemen getting extra cash. Uh, and Lady Pennant was in there. No issues with those fighters getting extra cash, so 
Kudos and nothing that I'm arguing about. You know, there was not a better fight than Fazeev and Green. And the performances in question were all certainly bonus worthy. So that was UFC 265. You can find my full report in the MMAZona411mania.com. Please give it a read. I always appreciate whatever support you can throw my way in that particular respect. All right, we have short bits of news to discuss, so let's get into that as quickly as we can. Uh, UFC 267, we have a little bit more information on this. Um, Dana White would like it to air on ABC. Now, for those of you who may not remember, UFC 267 is currently set to air October 30th, 2021, from Abu Dhabi. The This is the one that's going to be headlined by Jan, Blaho- Jan Blahovic and uh, Glover Teixeira. Also on this card, Aljamain Sterling and Peter Jan's rematch. What else does that card have? The card is also supposed to have Islam Makashev and Rafael Dos Anjos. Why would you do... You know what... Credit to Rafael Dos Anjos for just being the man that man is just in the trenches. But why are you taking another fight with another wrestler who's going to put you on the fence and stall you out? Just why, man? Why? Uh, but, anyway, so that's on there. Um, Kamzat Shamayev is supposed to return on that card. We'll see if that plays out against Li Jing Leong. Not a bad fight. Um, yeah. So they that event would take place uh, would take place prime time in Abu Dhabi, so early morning here in the United States. And Dana White wants it to air on ABC. That doesn't seem unreasonable. So we'll keep an eye out on that. But that's that's what that's the UFC's desire at the moment. And as already mentioned, 267 will not be a pay-per-view here in the United States. So we'll keep an eye on that when we get more specific details, uh, such as they emerge, I suppose. Uh, All right, very quickly here, some unsurprising news as far as this goes. But the inaugural UFC Women's Flyweight Champion has been cut from the promotion. If you just went, who was that? The answer is Nico Montano. Uh, I need to look up her record because she has not been especially active. Yeah, so Montano won the title in December 1st, 2017 at the finale of that season of The Ultimate Fighter. She beat Roxanne Modafferi to do so and was subsequently stripped of the belt. Um... Man, this was, yeah. She was supposed to fight Valentina Shevchenko at UFC 228. Montano's weight cut went horribly. She actually had to be hospitalized. Uh, The UFC decided to strip her of the belt, and Valentina then beat... Who was it Valentina smashed to win that? Wasn't Jessica I. She was already champion. I don't know why I am blanking on this. Um, just a second. Uh, Joanna. Yeah, she fought Joanna Janjacek for the vacant belt. That was a pretty good fight, actually. Um, Mon- so that was sep- so that was supposed to happen in September of 18. Um, Montagna was then suspended. Uh, she failed a drug test uh, for however much value you want to give that. If it's that short a suspension, she probably was able to prove that it was a supplemental issue. Um, she was supposed to fight Sarah McMahon. So she didn't fight in all of 18. She fights again July of 2019, up at bantamweight, loses to Juliana Pena. She gave Pena a tough first round and then just kind of couldn't maintain the pace. Then... The following series of events happened. She was supposed to fight Macy Chasson. Uh, she suffered an injury. She was supposed to fight Julia Avila. Before her coach tested positive for COVID, then she tested positive for COVID. Uh, then there was a... She was supposed to fight somebody else. There was... Tra- uh, and there was travel issues. I think that was... 
Uh, when was that supposed to be? Yeah, they were. Su that was uh, that was supposed to be at an event that took place in Abu Dhabi. She again travel restriction issues. Uh, she was supposed to fight Carol Hosa um, in February of this year, and she pulled out. She was supposed to fight Wu Yanan, and, th and then this this fight. All right, sorry, not this fight, but uh, last week UFC and ESPN 28. She was supposed to fight Wu Yanan. And weighed 143 pounds. The U, uh, the apparently the athletic commission wouldn't allow that fight to go forward given that particular weight discrepancy, and the UFC at that point had had enough. <sighs> she is going on my list for uh, for the Ian McCall Memorial Worst Luck in MMA Award because man, that is a rough 2021. A really rough 2021. Uh, all right. So she's gone. And yeah. All right. Uh, that's everything I have on my list. Let me check Twitter, see if anything crazy is broken. If not, we will plug and get out of here. Nope, nothing crazy. So as for my stuff this week... Big thing, of course, Tuesday will be a review for The Suicide Squad over on Damn You Hollywood, the James Gunn film that was released in theaters and on HBO Max uh, this last Friday. That will be myself, Mark Radlich, and Alexis Haina. Stop by. Here are thoughts on the movie. It should be an interesting discussion. A lot of people are gushing over this. Uh, I will not be gushing over it, so we'll see how... I imagine a few different discussions will spawn out of this, so we can... Should be a good should be a good time. So tune in for that. Uh, let's see, do I have anything else? I don't think I have anything else podcast related. So just AEW's Dark Elevation on Monday, MLW on Wednesday, assuming MLW releases anything. They're still in a bit of a uh, scheduling out their next set of tapings and whatnot. So we'll see. We'll see if they have anything for us on Wednesday or not. And WWE SmackDown on Friday. There is no UFC event on Saturday. The original plan for this next week was something from London, but due to travel restrictions and a few other... Due to the state of the world, uh, they that didn't happen, so I get a Saturday off, and then I'll be back on the... Tw the next UFC event will be UFC on ESPN 29, Cannoneer versus Gastelum. Look at that card. Oof. That is, uh... Huh. Yeah, that's definitely a series of fights. I can't say a whole lot more than that. Good grief. But I'll be back here next week to preview that event in its entirety. So we'll see how that shakes out by then. See what the week has in store for us. Uh, yeah, until next time, everyone, that's my plugs for this evening. Thank you very much again for listening. Stay safe out there and continue to be well, be safe, and, of course, behave. <laughs>